Hello, welcome to video part two of uh, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. I want you to take a look at this specific geometry for a second. You see the two parabolas on either side and an inertial flywheel as an analogy right here in the center. This is the dielectric inertial plane within every magnet. Now most people don't know how magnets are actually created. Capacitor banks are charged up, they're released, and either the ferrous or the neodymium iron boron or other types of uh, ferromagnetic material are charged up. Can you see the inertial plane right here? It's right now the quote-unquote poles are on either side here. It wants to move because there's actually a steel object underneath there. Either pole of the magnet is here and here. These are the centrifugal at the edge of every magnet and the returning centripetal. This is centripetal, inertial, counterspatial, and radial. In uh, electrical engineering, you actually taught that dielectricity is electrical inertia, just like the flywheel of a gyroscope. Think of it the same way in the analogy. You have both axes here, and you have your inertial plane here. As you can see, this, these are the quote-unquote poles, and here is the dielectric inertial plane looking at the velocity viewing film. They call it magnetic viewing film, but all this stuff does is has nanoparticles of ferrous material and it shows you velocity. But this is the center of the magnet. Of course, a magnet has no center. This is part of field incommensurability. So, now let's take a look at something else. Let's put our chalkboard away, and you remember our little magnetic toy here, right? Full of hundreds of little nails with their little flat heads on top. So, what happens if, say, these top of these pin heads are the dielectric inertial plane, which they are in our fast approach? Here, one, two, three. You see that? Now, let's turn it upside down, give it a good shake, and take a look. You see that? You see this circle of raised nails didn't come forward? Let's try that again. This time let's remove any dielectric charge by rubbing our hand across the top of the nail heads and do a faster approach so we can spin up the inertial plane of the nail heads better. One, two, three. Turn it upside down. Give it a shake. You'll see we have a larger void spot right here in the center. Do you see that? without tilting it too much so the nails don't fall back. I can do the same thing there. See, we have a large void spot here. Well, what's happening? So, like anything that's spun up in field incommensurability, let's do the same thing and this time add an additional time variable. We're going to do the same fast approach. One, two, three. Now, we're going to give it a few seconds for the dielectric inertial plane. Remember we're getting reaction at zero degrees but dielectric spin up at 90 degrees to the approach with the time variable. Now we're giving it about 10 seconds and then we're going to flip it over and just like any flywheel that isn't constantly sped up it will eventually wind down. So now let's turn it upside down, give it a shake and see what happens. Oh look! There isn't such of a big hole in the center now. You see that most of the nails came forward. We allowed our flywheel to spin down. So, what exactly is happening? Well, in approaching the nails, the same as our gyroscope here, the dielectric inertial plane, like the gyroscopic flywheel, is spun up on the fast approach. That's why when we immediately turned our uh, analog upside down we had a large circle of nails that wouldn't come forward but when we gave it enough time for the charge to dissipate just like the flywheel in a gyroscope what happens is exactly what's happening now in the inner atomic magnetodielectricity of the ferrous iron atoms 
this. That's why so many nails came forward after giving it a few seconds for it to spin down, the same as our gyroscope. You have to understand field incommensurability, that's a whole new science, but magnetodielectricity is not something new. What people don't understand is what a magnet is, how a magnet is created. Most people have no idea that an enormous electrical charge is put through these and their creation. What that does is it creates field incommensurability in this special conjugate geometry. Exactly like this. You see the two hyperbolas? Download the book, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. And uh, obviously you'll get a lot better diagram than this uh, pathetic little chalkboard. But what is occurring here is that we place our magnet here with quote-unquote both fields top to bottom is we have a dielectric inertial plane here. Now in our gyroscopic analogy, before a magnet is actually created, imagine trillions and trillions of little gyroscopes with their flywheels like this. This would be the axis here. Okay, then we have another axis here and a flywheel like that. Okay, we have another axis here with a flywheel like that. Okay, the notion of domains as explanation is incorrect. It's a rough crude analogy, but this doesn't tell you what's happening physically when a magnet is created. They're all going in opposite directions. Same thing as taking five gyroscopes independently and spinning them all up. Even though they're not connected, they will create field incommensurability. Their XY dielectric axis will point in the same direction, and their Z expanding radial magnetic axis will all point in the same direction. In other words, if I had five gyroscopes here and they were all spun up, they'd all be pointing exactly like this. Now, don't take the analogy too far, of course. But what happens is, in electrification, all those trillions and trillions of ferrous magnetodielectric geometries line up, and what we have is perfect field incommensurability, where magnetism is conjugating centrifugally and centripetally, and the entire magnetic mass is acting in unison. If you don't know what incommensurability is, you might need to Google it to understand it. It goes all the way back to Pythagoreans. It has to do with the golden ratio. Now there are specific angles here, 137.5077 and an angle of 85 on centrifugal reciprocation under a perfect ideal situation. So, I hope you understand things a little bit better and what's exactly happening in our analogs because understanding magnetism is not something that you can read about or really understand simply unless I give you good analogies, make things abundantly clear, lucid, transparent, logical, sensible, rational, rational, explainable by all phenomena. Just imagine this as the dielectric inertial plane, all these little top of these pinheads. What happens is on the fast approach here, one, two, three, turn it upside down, give it a shake. You see this ring of the nails that didn't want to come forward? That's the exact same thing as our gyelectric flywheel here, which is spun up. These do not want to be come up because do not want to raise up on turning it upside down and flipping it because the dielectricity has been spun up in these nail heads so that they do not want to approach magnetism. Magnetism and dielectricity move 180 degrees opposite to each other. And then you say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any bloody sense because you're just showing me a conjugate diagram that shows something different than moving 90 degrees opposite to each other. Here we have the dielectric inertial plane and here we have our two reciprocal fields centrifugal and centripetal of magnetism, that is 90 degrees. So you're saying, how could they be moving opposite to each other? Well, in any conjugate system, as you can actually find, the absolute inverse throw of a sphere is a double hyperbola. Like a dog chained on a leash to its dog house, Imagine those two entities trying to get as far away from each other as possible. What is the maximum throw in a crude vernacular of two fundamental forces, dielectricity and magnetism, to move away from each other? Well, it is an accretional type plane like this and a double hyperbola. 
Remember, magnetism is spatial, dielectricity is counterspatial. Okay, you have a centripetal field here returning from the other side, and you have a centrifugal field here on either side, leaving the edge of the magnet. And you have the dielectric inertial flywheel right here. It is incommensurability, or field incommensurability. If you actually Google or download the book Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism, you will see this in everything in nature. Obviously, everything macroscopically is mirrored microscopically. Google the word galactic jet. Okay? Galactic jet. You will see this specific geometry over and over again in thousands of pictures. Nobody really understands what a galactic jet is or what's going on, but it's the exact same thing that's going on in a magnet, except on a stellar scale. You have an accretional disk like this, and you have conjugate magnetism. This would be the centripetal, like this. A double hyperbola of centrifugal and centripetal magnetism, and an inertial radial centripetal dielectric inertial plane. You can think of it as a as an analogy to get a better thought in your mind is the flywheel. This would be the flywheel, the moving part. This is what drives a magnet. And this is just an analogy, of course. Don't take the analogy too far. The dielectric inertial plane, or the flywheel, inside the center of every magnet. Not here, not on either quote-unquote pole. There is no polarity, clockwise and counterclockwise. I'm spinning the magnet in one direction. It looks clockwise from one direction and counterclockwise from the other direction. It's just a spatial anom anomaly of human perception, obviously. There is no inverse spatial or counterspatial spin. But right in the middle here is the dielectric inertial plane. Right there. Like I said, you can take any magnet and cut it a billion times if you're able to, and within every slice there'll be a quote-unquote north pole and a quote-unquote south pole, and a dielectric inertial plane. This is what a magnet is. It is mimicked in nature. Like I said, Google the word galactic jet and then look up the pictures for same. It's the exact thing that's happening in a gyroscope, and most people, obviously, basically everybody out there, well, there is nobody out there that actually understands magnetism. This will be the first book you'll ever see to explain magnetism. Period. Logically, rationally, and accurately. Nobody understands magnetism, that's one thing, but most people also don't even know how a magnet is actually created. What you think of as a magnet is not a magnet, it's a dielectric object. Within each perfect magnet under ideal conditions and under ideal geometries, there is 3.236 or phi times phi, phi squared, to one part magnetism. 3.23606 parts of dielectricity to one part of magnetism. You can say, well, why do we call it a magnet then if it's predominantly di uh, dielectric? Well, it's the same way a kid at a puppet show only recognizes the puppet and he can't see the big puppet master standing behind the curtain pulling the strings. Magnetism is spatial. That is why humans see a magnet, i.e. an electrified dielectric object, as a magnet and not as a dielectric object because that which is seen by human in our obvious pathetic little senses is the spatial magnetic field even though it is only one part out of a total of five cubed of a total of a uh, portion of dielectricity 3.23606. So, that ends of video number two. Remember to download the free book, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. Volume number, edition number three will be out within the next month. And remember to ask me any questions you have upon about magnetism. Our next little video is going to be ta talking about uh, field demonstration tools, all the various types, why they work, why they don't work. And uh, I won't be talking about the one that I just invented. I just invented, by the way, and I plan on getting it patented, the world's first 3D real-time viewing of the magnetic vortex. That has been uh, one of the great conundrums throughout many, many years by many people, is creating a perfect demonstration tool, not just showing where a field is or how it's split, but how it conjugates in a vortex, centripetally, centrifugally. I have created the world's first, and I've shown this to people and I've knocked their socks off, I've created the world's first 3D viewer of uh, the vortex conjugation of a magnet. It's fantastic. I've been so happy. I've actually been celebrating for the past week. So, thanks. Remember to download the book, Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism. Send me any 
email or questions that you have, I'd be willing to answer any of them, and I guarantee you that, uh, most importantly, it will be rational, logical, sensible, and explain to all observed phenomena. Thanks for watching.